Welcome to Overcome Out Loud with Charlie Smith. This is where I sit down and I get to talk to real people that have overcome real obstacles in their lives to give you hope. And, and today is really kind of an amazing day for all of us to have on Wes Gear. Wes is a famed musician, guitarist for the band Korn. He is, in my opinion, most importantly, the founder of Rock to Recovery. He's had an incredible career as, as a musician and an artist. And now, no coincidence, we're here during... Uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, West, to, to talk a little bit about what you've been through and share your story. And I just want to thank you personally for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. I, I always say uh, <laughs> towards the end of my drinking and using, nobody wanted to hear a word I had to say. If I started talking, they turned the other way. So to have anybody want to talk to me is an honor. Yeah, for, for sure. And, and you know, I, I know given your, your career and your history that it started somewhere. So you, you came from a big family. You were born in, in Fullerton with, with a big family, eight kids. Well, you've done your research. That's awesome. Uh, uh, um, yeah, so, well, technically I'm an only child. My dad had five kids. My mom had two kids. They split up, got together. First of all, let's just talk about how they're like, oh, you got five kids, I got two. Let's get together. And then hey, let's have another one. They had me. So, uh, um, yeah. So, you know, not the traditional big family, um, a lot of halves. And then my parents divorced when I was five. So everybody kind of scattered. And so an in, in, interesting um, scenario. But yeah. And the love of music from a very young age for you? Uh, yeah. You know, my I think there's, you know, we have the genetic thing to consider which is my my grandfather was uh the director of the of music at the church which back then was a very traditional classical bass choirs and all sorts of instruments and my mom sang in the choir so i grew up hearing that my grandma played violin um with uh the orchestra um with one of the directors from the boston pops so there's definitely some skills in there um and so I think it was just kind of in me a little bit. I didn't know it because I didn't care about music for a while. And I think the first time it really hit me where it struck a chord with me, oh, pun slash dad joke, was when I heard my brother play Smoke on the Water, which after hearing all this beautiful Mozart and classical harmony, that damn, 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 was just real at that edge. I, I remember being really young, but going, what the heck? whoa what's that right there and, and i think that's planted the seed well planted a it planted a seed obviously that got watered and and how was it chasing your your music career and your family you know with a with coming from a, a kind of two families that came together you you kind of wedged into the middle of two families and then your family getting divorced how was the the family dynamic for you what was school like for you and and where when did music start to play a bigger role in your life uh, so, uh, my parents split up when I was five and I went to live with my mom and then, um, fast forward to about age 11, she re, um, connected with a high school sweetheart. So we relocated because when my parents divorced, we went from California to Massachusetts. We came back to California to be with now my stepdad, um, we got, uh, we got kind of some, you know, we're moving around a little bit. We got some roots in Garden Grove, California, and I started to make some friends. It was probably the longest time I remember being in a, in a place for a while, like a few years where I felt solidified. And I started playing guitar with a, some kids in the neighborhood. And I mean, we're horrible, you know, 11, 12 years old. But then my mom wanted, they, well, my family wanted to move. And I remember that really messed with me. Um, because I, and it's funny because when it's, when you're in it, you know, oftentimes we don't realize the impact it's having on us emotionally one way or the other. Um, but that hit me. And I remember being really bummed to have to leave my friends. I suppose that a lot of kids could be when they move. And uh, I think it's probably a natural reaction. Um, and a lot of kids move and it's not a big deal. But what happened is when I got to El Toro Lake Forest area down South Orange County, I didn't have any friends yet in the guitar. I was new on the guitar. So the guitar was my best friend. I just played all day, every day. And one thing I did um, was I've always been really, it's funny because when I was younger, people would think I was really cocky and smart ass. And I was just overcompensating. I was trying to be funny and I was really off putting. 
And it, the, the big book talks about it. You know, we step on the toes of others and they retaliate, you know, seemingly unprovoked, but it was really an act of self that brought that on, you know? And so here I had kids going, man, I don't want to beat you up. And I'm like, man, I just want you to like me. I'm trying so hard. And so that just made me fall further into guitar. And that's when I discovered weed because it was an easy way, you know, uh, booze and drugs were, were my way in. Let's go hang out with the kids with the, you know, ripped jeans and rocker shirts on. Those are my people. You smoke weed. I'll smoke weed. Cool. Now we're tight, bro, because we both smoke weed. And I get stoned and play guitar all day long. It's so funny. You know, it, it, it actually is really ironic in a way, because last week we had a guest on who's who's one of my my coaches and 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 performance experts. And he moved from Canada when he was young and, and he's not an, in recovery. He's he's actually, you know, a, a really mentally health guy who's never struggled with substance abuse. But we were talking about him having to overcome moving from Canada down to the U S and he had hockey as his love when he was in Canada. And when he moved down here, it was a bit of a shock and he, he got into basketball and it's amazing to me how, because I come from a very damaged personal truth about myself, right? I mean, you talk about how you felt inside was, was a, a feeling of insecurity. And so you project something on the outside that you want people to see. And I think the big book talks about that. You know, we present this stage character, but inside we don't feel like we deserve it. He picked up basketball. You and I, to deal with our insecurity, started to go deeper inside. And, and then we put on these masks, you know, to try to show or please other people and, and fit in because we do desperately want to fit in. But how we do that seems to be a little awkward for us. And so I picked up a, my first, uh, my first drunk drink when I was 12. It sounds like you weren't far behind me in terms of finding that ease and comfort in something outside yourself. Yeah, I would guess it was probably 14 years old, right around when I started playing guitar, uh, maybe a little earlier, but I think 14 is when I smoked my first weed. And of course it was like a out of body experience at that age when I finally did get high. Um, you know, I think this is my, theory i think when i hear watch listen learn to other alcoholics and or slash addicts that most of us have an anxiety disorder a low level may non you know in most cases non-diagnosed anxiety issue which is where because we're always just like you know worried about what did i say something wrong did you like me it's just like and, and i watch it with newcomers and i see myself in it because you can't, you know, when you're newly getting sober, you can't really see yourself as others would see you. And, and you know, whenever I work with new people, I just, they're, and I, they're just all over the place and frantic. And I'm like, yeah, that's me. That's how I was. And I'm a little bit that way, but recovery's help. But I think it's, it's part of the thing that, that is what the disease is. It, it is. That is, that is actually so well-spoken. I think what you describe are these unhealthy coping mechanisms to that feeling. So it's like, you know, I always say I had a damaged personal truth. I didn't know how, you know, mine came from trauma, right? So I, I had a violent upbringing. And so for me, that damaged personal truth was, you know, magnified by the fact that I had a dad who put a gun to my head and a lot of th things traumatically that happened to me. But I think for all of us, you know, I had Joel Rolampagos on the other day was the executive producer from Biggest Loser. And for him, his mom had postpartum depression. And so she wasn't able to love it. Like when he was looking for love, she wasn't there from him and he couldn't feel unconditional love. And, it, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the recent things I've read that you put up about how we 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 kind of predispose the future based on our past experiences. And sometimes those experiences aren't necessarily telling us the truth, but yeah, we've got this feeling of ease, unease and discomfort about ourselves. And you're right. We're kind of hypervigilant. We're like trying to just figure out for whatever reason, how I can fit in and, and we choose some unhealthy ways to do it. And, and it sounds like that was the case for you too, man. Yeah. But I think it's important. I always like to kind of reframe this too, you know, um, well, mo pretty much everybody has emotional trauma. It's part of living yep. and you don't have to be raped or beaten up or gun to your head to have emotional trauma. And I learned this later in life. Like my, one of my friends, he's a uh, great therapist. And he says, you know, an emotional trauma could happen when you're uh, an infant or a young boy. You go, mom, come here. I need a, and the mom goes, hold on, honey, I'll be right back. And you go, ah. And if that moment encodes or like, I've heard stories of like talking to a girl, like, how come you don't wear open toe shoes? Oh, my mom said I had ugly toes when I was five. Wait, 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 hold on. She said you had ugly toes. Maybe she's kidding. Oh yeah, I didn't think that. So the rest of your life, you don't wear open toe shoes. The point is when we talk about this stuff, what we have to, 
I feel it's important to make this point to people is emotional traumas don't have to be something huge and massive. They just happen in life when we get hurt or we don't get our needs met. And it doesn't mean that anybody even did anything wrong. Thank you. We just internalize something. Like, for example, if a girl, if you go, hey, you want to go out with me? She's like, no, that could break our little heart. She didn't do anything wrong. It just sometimes, and then then all of a sudden, we're afraid to say, hey, do you want to go out with me? We're afraid to wear open toe shoes again because our brain creates this little story, like you're saying, hypervigilance, meaning it's trying to keep our, us safe. Your brain goes, so I tell people, it's like, if you're out in the woods and you're like, a, you're whatever, a cowboy, and you hear a, a crack and you turn around and there's a bear there, rah, when you hear a crack again, you're going to, is that a bear? So, but this stuff happens on an emotional level. Like, oh, I asked a girl out, I got hurt. I'm not asking another girl out. And the thing is, it doesn't happen consciously. It happens the same way. Crack. You don't go crack. Remember that bear last time? It's just instantaneous. So we have these emotional reactions that are just wired, literally scientifically proven wired neural pathways. So like, I'm not asking a girl. I'm not wearing open toe shoes. I'm never going to think about it again. It's just done. Boy, you thank you so much, Wes. And you just, you just said it so perfectly. I call them. You know, I've learned to call them soundtracks that got laid down, you know, these records that some that, that I interpreted as a certain song and I interpret this, you know, probably re very relatable for you in, in the way I frame it, which is, you know, they didn't mean to write that song for me, but I heard the record that way. I played the music that way. My brain started putting it on repeat. And then I envisioned everything that happened to me through the lens of that song. And, you know, we spent a lot of time kicking the record player. And fortunately, I think both you and I have learned to change the music. And, and, and now instead of crack, instead of bear, we hear, oh, Maybe a friend's coming up on maybe a friend's coming up on me. I can't wait to see him. But it does yeah. take that, right? It does take yeah. that reframing because we don't know how those childhood incidents affect the the wiring. And some kids, you know, have, have wiring that hasn't put one's pair, pair of glasses on, and, and you and I might have a different pair of glasses on. So I really, I mean, it's so important to talk about those those situations in that context, man. Yeah. Uh, and we have to, I think we have to also talk about is we, um, we have to become aware and things like meditation help because, you know, what happens is like, especially when I was younger, I didn't know my parents' divorce bothered me, but it gave me a sense of like uh, not having self self-worth and stuff like that. But, and so it was framing and inhibiting things I might do out in the world because deep down inside subconsciously, I didn't feel like I had so I didn't have self-worth and self-esteem and, and um, so I had to learn and become self-aware and kind of separate, you know, the, the small self and the big self or the higher self or, you know, and start being able to observe my thoughts and things like meditation and working with a therapist and working steps. And it's a practice that we develop over time because I don't, uh, first of all, I don't want to get in like spiritual ego. I'm, I'm just like everybody else. Uh, but, but there, but there's a large portion of the world that is entirely unaware of their emotional reactions oh bob he's just angry okay we can say that but why is bob angry where does his anger come from we can just go oh, he's just you know he's just bob he's just a guy kind of gets angry why let's dig down let's figure this out a lot of the world just go on and that's just how they are well why <laughs> they weren't just how they are that way when they're a baby they they weren't and it's very it's very true how these patterns develop and and they do develop and then then we take on an identity as you said you know that old kind of Popeye mantra I am what I am and it's just not true because I can tell you that I am not who I used to be not so much because yeah. anything I didn't, have, I didn't have any plastic surgery I haven't gone undergone some transformation I didn't have a brain transplant but the way I see the rest of the world but most importantly the way I see myself has changed and I think that's what mm -hmm. I've what I've witnessed in the in the way you describe your journey through life um yep and I want to go, I want to go back to that because it's amazing where you've come from. And so, you know, obviously it's progressive disease. We both know it's chronic and it's progressive and, and over time it gets worse, never better. And, and, you know, obviously when you're living the lifestyle of a rock star for all intents and purposes, you know, and, and obviously you went from a young person playing guitar in, in, in Southern California to, to striking out and having some success, what I've found, and, and I want you to talk about a little bit how that success, you know, 
although it, it to the outside world was incredible. Did you take it in? Did you feel successful for a period of time or, or did you still have that emptiness inside that you were chasing? Wow. This is a deep topic because I have this real fascination with fame from the side of mental health, because uh -huh. I have friends who are much more famous than I've ever been. And I, yeah. and I watch how it's like a corrosive force. And again, everything we do wires the brain, good experiences, bad experiences, whatever. And I just watch what fame does. And so, and then if we go back to like me personally, and what I've learned of alcoholism is like, um, you know, egomaniacs with an inferiority complex. So you give an insecure guy who doesn't feel love, uh, feel lovable and whatever. And then I, so I'm insecure. So then I'm trying to be a perfectionist to overcompensate. So I'm playing guitar. I got to be the best. So then I want to have success with my band because I want, it's an easy way for you to like me or get top approval you know, and that could be anything, career, gym, yoga, anything people out there are doing. If you're going all in, I got to get, I'm still too fat. I go lose another three pounds. It's like just looking for that outward thing to make you get a leg up in the world or more acceptance. So, you know, when I was out there, you know, it was feeding my ego in an unhealthy way. You're asking me if I was feeling it. So to answer that, to really feel success, you have to be really spiritually founded because the way we should feel it is like, I'm proud of myself. I worked hard. I did a good job. I'm lucky as shit that all that turned into success because it doesn't for everybody. So thank you with a grain of humility and how can I be of service? That's, you know, but for me, it was like, you know, it's pomposity and, and, and boasting, you know what I mean? And it wasn't a real sense of uh, feeling it in this, in the good spirit sense. And then, so, you know, to give you a story to explain what I'm talking about, I could play a show uh -huh. to a thousand people that came out to see my band and, and walk out of the crowd. People, oh, Wes, uh, you're so great. You play guitar so great. And now I'm annoyed. Like, uh, and you're trying to be nice. Yeah, thank you for these people. Just leave me alone. And then I have to go drink. And I'm like, I am so fucking alone. I am so alone. And I'm in a room with people who arguably might think I'm cool and want to talk to me. But I felt like the most alone guy in the world. It's a fucking weird place to be. It is. I always, it's so funny you mentioned that because I, when I talk about that and I, I talk about some of the symptoms of alcoholism and, you know, people think hangover and destructive and DUIs. And I go, isolation is one of the biggest symptoms of dishonesty. And, and, and I love the way you talk about it because you can feel isolated in a room full of people because you just don't feel comfortable. Like you have anything to offer it, no matter what the external noise or, or billboards or, you know, accolades may say to the contrary, it really isn't. It, it, and I love the way you describe how success would, you know, how, how this version of you would talk to that version of you about success, because it's so much more authentic, but we don't really have any touch with our authentic self. And so it's a crave, it's a craving for more and it's never enough. And we seem to escape back into to the bottle to avoid it. And that's a pretty bad cycle, right? We get into a pretty bad cycle. Yeah. Um... Because the, the enough that we're fueling with looking hot or buying the shirt, it kind of spurts out some happy juice in your brain for a minute and it goes away. But when we talk about, I think I drooled on myself. When we talk about um, recovery, Flashback. what I've learned, <laughs> I see yeah, I'm a drooler. Um, when we talk about recovery, the happy juice comes from the inside. So I find fulfillment and that's why all these, you know, counterintuitive things like go help somebody else is going to help me be of service is going to help me like all these things I was taught start making it so I feel fulfilled on the inside and then it kind of wells up from my heart instead of like you know oh I got this new watch and it's kind of like an ego fluff that squirts a little dopamine for a minute and goes away you know oh oh some hot chick on tinder like oh juice happy juice for a minute and then it goes away when it's like my lifestyle and the way I'm living and it's welling up from inside of me through an actual connection and real fulfillment and authenticity, I'm my authentic self in the world, then I think uh, we don't have that need, that insatiable urge. Yeah. And it's, and so as you, <laughs> if you didn't just hear that, you might want to rewind that because that is, that's called long lasting peace and serenity is that authentic self who can just accept oneself. And, and it's funny because, because people will say you've gone, you've, you're now close to, is it 11 years now since you've been clean and sober? 
13 and, 13 and a half. That's right. Cause that's right. 13 and a half, a half year by I mean, and, and it's not that you can't drink or use it's that you don't need to anymore. You feel totally fulfilled, right. but I have to imagine West that, you know, the lifestyle, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the image of, of fame and the image of, of leading the lifestyle of a rock star. Is it, was it hard to, to, to come to grips with your alcoholism in, in the context of living that lifestyle or what was, what was the lead up to the bottom like for you? Yeah. Um, you know, at the height of when it was working, because most of us drink and use because it's working for a while, you know, and maybe we got a couple little problems and or hangovers, but it, 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 it's a small price to pay for what we feel, what I felt was what I was getting out of it. And I remember people hit me up saying I had a problem in my mid twenties. And I was like, I'm on the short term program. I don't care. I was resigned to like, yeah, I'll probably OD. And that's cool with me. I remember, I could remember being drunk and walking down the road, like having a great time with the friend, dude, you're out of control, man. You're going to like, yeah, man, I'm going to die young. Cool. So, you know, I guess I knew something was different and then, you know, but the, the thing is with addiction is like, I never thought to quit is it's about controlling and enjoying it. If I could just control it and enjoy it, which those two never live simultaneously. Cause if I only have a beer and I hit a weed, I'm not enjoying it. Although arguably I'm controlling it. And when I'm enjoying it, I'm obliterated. So, you know, I was trying to control and enjoy, which didn't go well. You have these periods of like, okay, that wasn't a horrible night, um, but it always goes back to how it was. And so then what ha usually happens for most people there I go drooling again, happened for me, which is that um, enough bad stuff happened in my life where I was like, okay, I got to stop drinking and using, you know? So I had got out of the band. My first band had PE and that was heartbreaking. And then I had a day job and that day job though was a good job was heartbreaking. It just like, and, and I was just so beaten down. Uh, and, after I left my band, I got even more into drugs. So like, you know, I was like kind of doing better, kind of doing better. And then left the band, got depressed. What do we do when we're struggling emotionally? We do more drugs. And I, I went back to meth and heroin and, uh, and my life got so bad. I had to, I had to try to change something. So I went to rehab. And that's, not, but I if your life doesn't crumble, you're not going to go to rehab. You know what I mean? If you're, you know what I mean? Who's going to go until horrible life things start happening, which yeah. is the irony. You it could is. be hung over, dope, sick, not sleep, not eat, all that drug or alcohol attached kind of uh, fallout doesn't do it. But when the DUIs and the court cases and the evictions and the career and the heartbreak get so bad, then you're like, well, maybe now I'll look at this addiction thing <laughs> it's so funny you say that because i think it's such a it's i think it does the disease such an injustice when we talk so much about rock, that you have to hit rock bottom because i mean yeah the elevator does go all the way to the sub basement there's no doubt about it but man you can get off at any floor i mean and it's yeah. so hard i mean it's the one does you know every other disease wants early intervention you know if you have diabetes they want to catch it early cancer catch it early you know there's there's something about the way that we talk about this that you have to hit rock bottom and and just you know i think you would agree that it's you know it's whenever you stop digging and it could be different for everybody but but it does take some catalyst and you know i hope you know through sharing our messages that people realize they don't have to go it's not going to get any better and you can get off at any floor you know we happen to have taken it to wherever we took it but you don't have to go all the way to the bottom and and, and there was further to go for us i mean let's not get confused here i mean you you and i both survived the peril of whatever bottom we hit but you know i have people in the i have people in my family that are you know not here anymore as a result of never getting off the elevator and that happens with this disease well rock bottom has a trap door you know and there's always another rock bottom um, and the big book talks about it, but who wants to stop when things aren't really, really, really bad. And that's the sad thing about it. So yeah, you don't have to go that far. Um, I think if you're, if you're struggling and it, and you're showing that you can't absolutely control on at every term, how much you drink or, and, or use, and, uh, then, then maybe look at <laughs> getting off the elevator. Yeah. Getting off the elevator. Cause it's really not, I mean, I think you and I, 
I think we'd probably both agree that it really, although we, we end up drinking a lot, using a lot, but it's really not why it's really not how much or what it's really why, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, it's a, why you drink or use that you've got to look at. And then B, as you talked about that on men manageability of what you want to happen, not happening or most or worse yet, what you don't want to happen keeps happening in in pattern and, and, and it's time to get off the elevator and you can get off at any point. Was it a, what did you, did you worry as a musician, um, you know, because it was such your identity and, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the misconceptions about a sober mus- musician's life or a, so- a sober artist's life, because I think there are some that I'm really excited to hear your perspective on, but were you worried that, that somehow it was going to change what it was you did and how you did it as a result of no longer having what you'd been using for so long? Well, when I got sober, I lost my band. And so my brain was telling me that like, you know, cause I know how hard it is to put together a band and get success. And I just, I didn't have it in me. Like it just didn't seem realistic. And of course, at first, one of the things that one of the biggest challenges people coming into recovery are faced with is that our brain tells us how recovery is going to be. Well, but have you been sober before? No, but I, I, the brain will tell you how the sobriety is going to feel. I know. Well, but brain, you and I, we've never been sober for six or a year, six months, a year, a couple of years and, and got some recovery work. Some says, yeah, but it's going to suck. Just trust me. And it said, you're not going to be able to play music. It's not going to be a part of your new life. And I believed it because how often do we go, hey, brain, you're lying to me. But unfortunately, the brain is wrong a lot. And we live our life based on the wrong decisions. Our brain kicks out. Uh, so, yeah, I, I. Uh, I wasn't fearing that because I had just accepted that I thought music was over for me. Uh, And it wasn't until I had almost three years sober and I stopped working my program and I got loaded again. And then I was sober a couple of years the second time. And I really was trying to, you know, just go to another level of making sure I, I I didn't mess up the way I messed up before or whatever. Um, And so then I started really feeling I was having pains for not playing i would see a show and it would just be painful to watch somebody else on stage not from the ego side from like a guttural like i'm supposed to be playing like i i love to do it and i have some talent in it and i should be playing and only for that reason not to get any accolades or anything so i started to meditate on getting back into music like okay and that was a 180 and I'm meditating, ah, uh, doing this awe uh, meditation for manifestation and going i want to get my music career back but I'm not going to get in some dumb punk rock band and drive around in a van. It better be a good band. And within 10 days, Corn uh, texted me within 10 days of that meditation, go, Hey, you want to come play with us? I was like, Whoa, this meditation shit's good. Um, by the way, anybody listening, Wayne Dyer, ah, meditation, a H ah, meditation for manifestation. Uh, it's all over YouTube. They put, get pulled down and somebody else, puts it up there but that that meditation's magic you you say ah you visualize it coming from your root chakra out your third eye you focus on the feeling of what it is to have what you want whether it be serenity or envisioning that new career path or the business you're launching you envision it and you do this ah thing and it's been really powerful yeah, I want to I want to talk about that because I think there's two really important principles, but I wanted to just back up because you said something really important and that was um, talking a little bit about your your relapse, which, you know, I think relapse is is not part of recovery. It's definitely part of addiction. It's definitely part of alcoholism. And, and you talked about that. You said I wasn't doing the things that I needed to do. And it led you back to a drink. And, and I think, you know, recovery is a human performance activity. I mean, it happened my friend, George Mumford, who's a performance expert, he's worked with elite athletes like Kobe and Michael, who celebrates 37 years in July, he says, and it's the performance of your life, but we tend to not treat it. We try, we don't tend to treat it like other things that we want to do, like playing an instrument or being an artist or getting good at math. We tend to think, oh, that's just something over there. My real goal is to raise funds for my new business. My real goal is to get her. My real goal is to get it. But, and recovery is just something that I'll, I'll attend to, but this stuff I have to take care of, but really it's just, at least for me, it's just the opposite. It's a, it really is a human performance activity, something I need to, you know, have on my calendar, have planned out, make part of my life. I mean, it be, as, as you say, habits 
you know, ultimately will make us. And, and so it sounds like you'd let go of some of that and felt you could get back to doing it on your own or, or how did that relapse happen for you? Yeah, it does. You, you phrase a lot of that the same way I phrase it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, heard the message that recovery has to be the most important thing in my life. And I got it. I was like, okay, right. Because if I'm loaded again, I'm not going to go to the gym. I'm not going to do all these things I love. I already saw that, but I stopped working on my program. And so like when people, like I talk to friends, they'll be like, they don't go to meetings anymore or they're not active. And they're like, but I don't even feel like drinking. I'm like, yeah, that's how I was. And that carried me until eventually I did, you know? So um, I have a mental health disorder that manifests itself with alcohol and drug addiction. And when I don't keep working on the stuff that keeps me on the beam, so to speak, you know, actively in a program of recovery, not just the gym, not just the other stuff, but actively in a program of recovery, um, then I start slipping back to, you know, being sick again, if you will. And eventually I will pick up. So when I came back, I, you know, it was like, what's going to be different this time? Well, I had to stay more um, connected to the program outside of the rooms uh, because I started at the end of my, right before my relapse, I started going to meetings late and then leaving early and not talking to anybody. So it was just like horrible. So now I make, I'm very connected with my, uh, you know, sober support group and my friends. I stay very connected to them and those kind of functions. Um, and I also, the other thing I said is I can never give up on work in my program. So like I pray every morning, not because I'm a religious, not because of anything, just because it works and I don't need to know how it just works. I pray, I read some spiritual stuff. This book I'm reading now, Paul Selig, this guy channels, I've watched him channel like guides talk to him on spirituality. I read a few, uh, pages and then I meditate on what they're talking about. I get centered. and I do my meditation and stuff like this. We're talking about recovery right now. This is, um, you know, this is part of my recovery program right here. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. And that's why I think for me, meditation, affirmations, you know, when I'm out there, when I'm living, and I think what you really talk about is, you know, kind of the center of our lives have become spiritual principles. And we practice those in all our affairs. You know, we practice hope, courage, discipline, service, awareness, patience, perseverance, faith in all of our affairs. And that means, you know, during a pandemic or at a concert or while we're playing or while we're on the phone with clients, you know, we practice these spiritual principles. And I think that's why, in my opinion, and and I'd be interested to hear yours, when you do your meditation and you do your own meditation and you're visualizing and and channeling and you're living a certain way, you've increased the probability of that text or that phone call from corn. When you're in an addictive state and you're separated from self and separated from others, you can do that shit all you want, but the chances that the universe is going to reward you with something long lasting, I think it gets diminished. In in my opinion, there's got to be this alignment that occurs for the universe to really speak to us. Cause I think I've missed a lot of opportunities while I was in the bathroom doing lines of Coke and then, and then meditating in the morning for, you know, although I didn't meditate, you know, I would say I would pray in the morning to get me out of another jam that never seemed to work for me, man. Yeah. Uh, well to put it in a super linear sense, like, uh, corn heard I was sober. So first of all, just that very obvious physical incarnation of sobriety was, <laughs> yeah. was how, how I got the gig. But, you know, this is something that I'm passionate about. Uh, we, you mentioned the vortex of radness. I don't want to talk about it in the vortex of radness because in the book that I'm, that the vortex of radness is something I used to jokingly say, I'm in the vortex of radness and people seem to latch onto that. So I, I'm moved to write this book and it's a, a lot of, it's going to be about what we're talking about. And what it is, is like, I believe as I've gone into science and religion and theology and the 12 steps and spiritual, for me, everybody's saying the same thing in just different ways. And then when you get into like, I'll just give quick examples, please. Uh, uh, Like Einstein said, you know, that which is like itself is drawn. Well, that's science and it's quantum physics. You can get into the law of attraction and you're saying the same thing, right? You, you vibrate at that frequency. You're going to bring it into your life. Okay, but that's a lot of attractions, new age spiritualism, dude. And then you got prayer where you're putting out 
like, if, especially, you know, if you're new, you're like, okay, God, universe, whatever, Allah, Buddha, whatever, higher power, I need your help today. Help me stay sober. Help me stay focused. What are you doing? That when you say those words, you're putting an energy out to the universe that it responds to. Everybody is saying the same thing. And that's what you're essentially saying. So it's funny that humans will go blast their glutes all day. They'll day trade doji coin or whatever that is. They'll do all these things. They'll, you know, go get their nails did. They'll do, you know, I got to get my eyebrows did and all this kind of stuff. How much time are they tuning their frequency to the to the universe and putting out what they want? So my brain, and I want to explain this to people, even at 13 and a half years, I'm very self-aware. My brain goes into like, you didn't do this. You should have done that. You're looking a little flabby. You didn't go to the gym. What about this? You said that comment. John didn't really like that. Maybe John doesn't like you. I mean, it just goes and it's problem, 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 problem. So when I get up and you said affirmations, what I've been doing the last few months, I say out loud, right? Because a lot of times, even when I had the corn gig, I would wake up and be like, <sighs> just proving that having that job, the dream job, doesn't just make you happy. Why I was so melancholy, I don't know. But now I wake up and I go, today, out loud, it's going to be an amazing day. And I'm going to do this and I'll name some stuff I'm going to do that I think is cool. I'm going to pray. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to go to the gym, meet my trainer. I'm going to see my band guys later. And then I say stuff like this. People love you. They're attracted to you. They're inspired by you. They look up to you. They think you're funny. You love people. You love learning about people. You love connecting with people. I say this shit out loud. Opportunity comes my way. It flows my way. Money, financial, all this stuff just flows to me. I am here to help the world. Show me who I can help. And I say it out loud because now when you do it, you're creating that energy. And back to it's, it's physics. You will draw that and you start believing it. And if you don't believe it, that it will work for you, go up to somebody and go, watch, I'm going to give you a compliment right now and just make the most elaborate compliment up that doesn't even seem real, right? Like you are the, hey, you're the raddest dude I've ever done a podcast with. You're so handsome. You're so freaking cool. I love that shirt. People can't help but be like, and feel that because the energy moves. You know what I mean? When we say and we hear things, we can't help but be affected by it. Oh man, it, you, you, thank you so much. I mean, this is powerful because I don't think what people understand is that our brains are pre-wired for survival. And so that negative, that I call it the inner critic, um, who's very loud. You know, you mentioned a lot of the things that our inner critic will say and people, you know, you, you can't silence your inner critic by telling it to be quiet in the history of telling people not to worry. I don't think anybody stopped worrying. The way to silence your inner critic is to embrace your inner champion and your inner champion is who you just described, who you really mm -hmm. see yourself as. And you, it's the only way to turn for me anyways, it's been the only way to turn down the volume of that inner critic is to embrace my inner champion, which is truly who I am at my essence. And I think people think, well, isn't that conceited or it's like, I'm going to listen to this guy who's nah. telling me a bunch of stuff, or am I going to listen to who I really want to be? And the answer is I'm going to listen to who I really want to be because that serves me. And, and, you know, actually the verbalization of negativity is four to seven times more powerful um, than actually saying nothing. And so when you verbalize negativity, you're actually increasing your subconscious mind's ability to see negativity. So I thank you so much for sharing and imparting that with with our audience because you know your inner champion is important man and if you haven't met your inner champion i think both wes and i highly recommend that you not only get to know him you get to know what he's going to say about you and you start to have that conversation with him because it could change your whole life yeah and you know it's interesting because you make I, I i love all the stuff you say we're so we're so in alignment you and i but the big book talks about um us you know get relieve me of the bondage of self and talks about stuff like that so i can be maximum of maximum service to others so well the reason i'm saying this is because like if somebody says well is that conceited no because the more i see how awesome and powerful i am and then add to it that i want to realize my true strengths and potential to be of the greatest service of the world and the people around me that's not being conceded. Not one bit. 
And I think it's amazing what you've done with it, because I want to talk about what was missing in recovery for you. I want to talk about how you brought this passion that you've lived with since you were young, you know, and turn that into something so important for people in recovery. Because I know music moves us. I know, I know music can move us in amazing ways. And, and if you're a gifted artist and, and you're in recovery and you've, you founded Rock to Recovery, which has been around for a while now, hasn't it? Yeah, we're in our ninth year. Yeah, check this out. And and so where did the inspiration come for that? And, and, and how did that serve you? And how is it serving other people? Because I find it to be inspiring in a lot of ways. Well, I was counting my money one day. And I just, you know, I had just so much money in my mansions and yachts. And I thought maybe God show no, actually, I, I say that jokingly, and you'll understand why <laughs> I was broke and scared is what happened. Um, so as much as I'd like to say I had abundance and decided to give to others, what it was is the corn gig went away. Brian, the original guy, came back to the band. Now I'm an out of work, 40 something um, year old musician. I started to get into self pity. Now, again, what we're talking about is recovery. I'm a guy who works the 12 steps. It's the coolest thing ever. Anybody could benefit from the 12 steps, but it's a design for a living. It's not a flare you shoot one time you get saved and you're good it's a design for living that i work in my life in everything especially the challenges so i went back to it and i was like okay i wanted to get in self-pity and i was like i'm a musician we're notoriously broken out of work and i gotta be sober poor me you know i'm like a diseased person and i said okay I don't think God or whatever you want to call it, put me here to be miserable, broke musician. So if this is who I'm supposed to be. I felt called to music and I'm supposed to be sober. How do I help people and make a living? And that was taught to me through recovery. I never prayed for other people, but again, in the big book, it says you can pray for others. You can pray for yourself if others are to be helped. So I said, okay, if this is who I'm supposed to be, how do I help people make a living? And then the idea and again, this is why it's also important is I created space for the information to come through. I offered up the prayer. I asked and asked and asked for direction and I meditated and wait and I listened and I shut up and I, I tried to disconnect from my brain as much as possible, which you can tell I'm ADHD spazoid. So it's always going crazy, but you create enough room, you know, for the, some of that sunlight to come through. And I had this idea, well, why don't you bring music to treatment centers? Okay. And when I was in my treatment center, we were drawing pictures of crayons. Cool. We were doing yoga. Nobody was taking it serious, whatever. Journaling, all these things, but there was no music. And I remember to be in a rehab when, you know, I have 22 guys. We talked about the social anxiety. It's clicky. You're like, that guy's weird. He's my homie. Fuck that guy. You know, there's all this insecurities going on. But I would break out my guitar and just be, oh, oh here's how we go. And I would be like... And everybody would start like, hey, hello, hey. it just, I was like, wait a second. Because when you're in treatment, it's even more profound the impact that had than For if sure. you're here in a car driving by. It changed the room. So th I remembered that. And guys, the cool guys start doing the two step, and we just started getting goofy. And I was like, there's something there. And so the idea for me was like, why the fuck are we not using music a lot more in treatment? And of course, I, I, ignorance is bliss. I didn't have any idea about how much music therapy was out there and how much was being done, but I didn't see it anywhere. So the, the goal of Rock to Recovery was like, let's figure out a way to help people um, recover with music. I just love it. And, I th and, and like I said, I mean, I think, you know, we all attach certain emotions to music all the time. And, and, and music is, it's a vibration, right? I mean, it is a, no matter what music it is that you relate it's to a it, vibration. It's a vibration. And, and I love the way you, you brought the two things together and how they come to you, because I think one of the misconceptions, or I think one of the fears, and I unfortunately have dealt with this a lot with the younger people that have, have had to deal with substance abuse issues and they're creative, whether they're artists, you know, drawing artists, painting artists, or musicians that they feel like they're going to lose their creativity, you know, that they hold on to that. And, and, and by the way, for the most part, as you know, towards the end, there isn't a lot of holding on. They're not holding on to much, but that can, you know, our mind is, does play tricks. And like you said, it's going to tell us these stories. And I, I love that you found incredible ways to actually 
level up your creativity and use it in different ways because I know people struggle with that. And, and you know, what advice, you know, I think, because obviously you, you have influence a, a lot in, in terms of your artistic ability, you know, how can you help the, the, the younger people that might be struggling with that misconception about, you know, life in recovery now that you've lived it for 13 and a half years? Well, yeah. Okay. First of all, does drugs and acid and mushroom and drunk and, uh, help us artistically? Sure, it does. And we're not going to pretend that it doesn't. It, 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 take, it changes us. It gives us new perspectives. And what mostly it does is it shuts off that, that voice that's like, nah, that's no good. That's stupid. We're just like, yeah, oh, this is the best painting ever. And a lot of times it sucks. And any artist listening or anybody who's a writer or whatever who relies on it, you, you know that a lot of times you think shit's good and it's not as good as you thought it is. But yeah, it does have its place. But here's the thing. I will die if I drink and use again. So it's not an option anymore. That's the thing I got to get over. If you're still going to look at it as an option, well, then go play and have fun and figure out if you can drink or use safely. I can't. It's no longer an option. So then I got to figure out how to get to my boat to the shore without the paddle I enjoyed using, so to speak. And what I learned is, is that the drugs and alcohol weren't writing the songs. I was writing the song. I have the talent. I could play guitar. I can hear a good riff if I, if I write one, you know what I mean? And so it's just about learning and practicing to do it sober. And then what you realize is that you can actually do it sober. It's very doable. And then you can look at other people out there like Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails, wrote his best record sober. Robert Downey Jr., actor, did some of his best work sober. I mean, the list goes on and on of artists who will tell you there is creativity and success on the other side. Oh, and by the way, who got the best gig of his life ever after he got sober? This guy. I got the corn gig because I was sober. So again, for me, it's like, Drinking to use is not an option. I had faith that I'm not sent here to be a miserable, sober musician. And I watch the successes of other people that happen in their life. I'll, I'll tie in this story. Uh, I would go to AA meetings. I was working for my brother. It was a great job, but I hated it. I didn't want to be there. I was lucky to have the job, but I just didn't feel right. And I'd go to meetings. I would go to meetings and people would come in. Oh, I lost the job today. What am I going to do? And, you know, like, oh, that sucks. Yeah. And they'd come in two weeks later. Oh, my God, I've got a better job than ever. I make more money. And, oh, my God. And that happened over and over and over and over. And I was like, you assholes. I want a new job. And that's when I got into meditation a lot. Why I started meditating. Well, anyhow, my brother fired me out of nowhere, which I knew was coming because it came to me in a meditation. That's a whole other story. So I was like, well, I want that to happen to me. What happened to everybody else? They lost their job and got the best job of their whole life. What happened to me? I got the motherfucking corn gig. Whoa. So there's this weird, like you're saying, like you're talking about energetically. If I, when I, I would relapse on meth and all my, my cars would break down. I'd lock myself out of the house. Everything goes wrong. Well, and then the opposite happens when I get sober is things start going right. I get out of my own way. I'm now uh creating with the power of the universe or whatever you want to call it god jesus buddha i don't care i'm creating with the power that put the heavens and the earth together and and amazing things start to happen i'm amused always by stories of people that lose jobs they hate that they know that they don't want to be at any, any longer and i think you know and and, and lastly you know we'll, 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 uh, your time's so precious and and so are you and but that is you know i think a concept that i want people that that understand resiliency is there's this concept of of the end is, is not the end, it's the beginning. You know, one door closes, another door opens. And if we can have that mindset of looking for the blessings or the gifts and everything that we are, that's occurring and see how we can improve our own lives as a result of it without getting into that, those disempowering emotions of self-pity, you know, those negative vibrations that actually put us out of the universe and out of touch with the universe, that we can look at things differently. And so I think, you know, for everybody that's, and look, everyone's going through stuff. Like you said, it, it doesn't have to be major. It, it's all relative, you know, that people, that an optimistic or optimistic or hopeful mindset is simply that, that the future is bright, you know, to the extent that I show up and, and, and engage in it, that one door closing is just another door opening for all of us. It's a choice. When COVID happened, it was very scary. And I said, okay, I'm going to figure out how 
to turn this into a positive. So when you make that choice, like I, this has just happened in my life. Okay. How, what are the pot? And yeah, sure. Maybe you smash your, you know, 30 mercury car and it's never going to be replaced. Okay. But what can you do to turn that into a positive experience? There's always things you can do and that's a choice. Boy, that is so well said, man. And, and can you just, um, and we'll obviously put it in the notes. Could you let people know where to follow you? I mean, and, and I follow you and, and what you're doing in all aspects of your life is incredible. Can you let people know how to stay in touch with you, Wes? Yeah. So I'm mostly on Instagram and I'm at Wes, W-E-S gear, G like good, E-E-R, G E. E R people always think it's something else. I'm not even going to say it. Cause then they'll think it's something else. Uh, West gear. And then one other thing I got to do is the shameless new plug of the new band. We're called human, but of course you got to spell it funny these days. I hope it's not backwards. It's spelt kind of like Q cause we're into color and frequency, but we use the three. Is that backwards? Oh wait, does that show up? No, nope, that's perfect. H U three. Okay. Uh, Okay, watch. So that's the first part, M3. So we changed the E's out for threes. So it's Hugh Men. Wait, there we go. Oh, I see it. That's, I dig it. Yeah. That's the new music coming out. Uh, catch us on Instagram or all the social media. We're, we're dropping a single coming up here. Um, and it does not suck. I did not lose my creativity because I'm not on piles of methamphetamine anymore. I'll say you didn't, man. And I, I got to tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure a couple of dudes like us would normally meet in the world, but I am so glad we did today. You are, you are a rad guy for sure. And I am, I feel like I've been in the vortex of radness for the last hour. So thank you for imparting your wisdom and sharing your story with us and coming on and overcoming it. It has been amazing, Wes. Dude, seriously, Charlie, you and I think a lot alike. I, I, I learned some stuff here and uh, you and talking to you today. Thanks for the opportunity to everybody out there. Uh, you know, welcome to the vortex of radness. <laughs> Can't wait. And when will the book be out? How's it coming? And when will it be out? Just as a side note. Uh, the vor Okay. So I screwed up. My co-authors would be pissed at me. The vortex of radness is next. The book that's coming out first is rock to recovery. Our book, you can find us online, which is rock T O spelt out recovery. We have a cool book that chronicles some of our work with like, uh, men and women old and young every demographic from sex trafficking to mental health to addiction and how music played a key role in them finding transformation oh that's great rock to recovery and, and we'll check that book out for sure and uh and west gear man oh, go one go. more thing sorry Hit me. i got the plugs i got Hit the me. Plugs. come on come on <laughs> you kidding me september 18th we do the coolest sober show around September 18th at the Fonda Theater in Hollywood. Completely sober show, an amazing venue. There's celebrities come out, red carpet. We're honoring uh, Dave Navarro this year from Jane's Addiction. Uh, people from Papa Roach are playing, System of Down, uh, uh, you know, musicians from, from Train, uh, you know, from obviously I played with Corn and Head PE. So it's going to be all stars, rock and roll, jamming, and it's a sober event and uh, it sells out every year. So I'm sure September it does. 18. I, uh, I will be there if I can get a ticket, man. I can't wait. Oh, we got you. We got you covered. You could, you could do a podcast from the parking lot or something. Can't wait, Wes. Dude, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your thank day, you. man. Love you. See you, you too, man. All right. See you, man. Bye. Later.